Thank you, Fiona. Um, every year we say we don't think we can do better than we did last year for the discussion forum. And I think this year, considering the circumstances, considering this, this has been a virtual event, uh, I think we've again proved ourselves wrong and had a fantastic day. So I should start by thanking all the presenters, all those who've chaired uh, sessions all the way through today because I think it has just been a fantastic day and thank you too to the audience for coming and contributing as much as you have. I think our major concern with the virtual event was that the contribution from the audience would be less and you've proved us wrong in that so thank you very very much for everybody. Um, just to try and sum up almost impossible day we've had three big sessions um, on the farm session, um, one of the key issues, I think, is trying to define what intensive farming is. And interestingly, uh, all the speakers couldn't actually agree on that. Quite obvious to me that there are very significant species differences and that we look at different species in different ways. And perhaps that's something that we should consider further for the future. The debate about whether health and welfare are connected, whether one depends on the other or whether is one, one is part of the other, uh, is another one which is a long-standing debate. How much of behaviour is, is, is intrinsic in animals? How much do cows actually need to go out and eat grass rather than be fed something that is provided for them? Another issue for an, a, another long-term discussion. And is stocking density what really matters with much of this? Um, and where does science point us in the direction of that? And is the bottom line uh, in farm animal welfare actually the quality of stockmanship, whether that's a small farm with a dedicated stockman or a large farm that's extraordinarily well served by stockmen, as well as the environment in which those animals are kept? So some interesting thoughts to go forwards there. In terms of innovation, um, the opposers were on a bit of an uphill battle with this, with 90 percent uh, agreeing with the with the resolution. Um, but they did a grand job. Um, but what came out for me was the importance of communication with the client when innovative treatment is being considered, how that's put and how it's regulated. And perhaps there's a space there for uh, the animal welfare, welfare assessment grid or something similar, so that there are some clear endpoints, so that uh, the results of innovative treatment can actually be properly uh, evaluated and therefore might be regulated. Although quite how you regulate something as complex, complex as that in veterinary practice is difficult to see. And the COVID session this afternoon, uh, quite clearly, the veterinary profession responded very promptly to what was, uh, a, a, to put it mildly, an unusual situation, coping with emergencies, but limiting uh, activity where it was really needed. The concerns of charities, not only in terms of their workload, but also in funding, uh, came to light at a very early stage. And uh, it also appeared very early on that we were going to have some very long-term effects from this. Um, the human effects on change of expectation of practices uh, and what they're prepared to accept and where the human expectation of welfare sits in all of that discussion. Perhaps we should be better at planning for these things, the unexpected, and how do you prioritise planning for the unexpected in the melee of day-to-day -day practice? Remote prescribing, of course, came to the fore, um, but um, I, there's a lot of work to do yet, and clearly quite a lot of division within the profession about what remote prescribing will look like in the long term. Of course, we should use nurses better. Uh, of course, they should be part of the vet-led team and the work that's being done by the Royal College BVA on the vet-led team needs to go on and needs to come to some con conclusions soon, because that is the way forward to allow vets to do the stuff that only vets can do so that other people can pick up some of the other bits. And above all, 
perhaps we should better define what is good care and get rid of this term gold-plated care, gold standard care, uh, care, gold-plated care, because uh, what we really want is good care that protects the animal's welfare. And then we've had some really good examples of research which AWF has funded over the years. And it just, I think all of them show how relevant they can be to practicing vets in the field, whatever species that you deal with. Euthanasia of large animals, um, lack of records, and a, a, an underlying theme with much of this, and that is training and management, how we could better train and manage euthanasia. And beef lameness, well, of course, a, a distinct lack of data, and a, a, that's almost intrinsic in, in beef farming, isn't it? That you don't get the same level of, of data of individual animals that you get perhaps with other species. And again, a training need. How do you train beef farmers to know whether their animals are lame or not? Simple as that. In terms of delayed euthanasia, uh, some really useful research there. And again, a training need in end of life care uh, and the whole hospice movement that's coming for, over from the pond as things in, in, inevitably do from the States. Fantastic bit of research on pandemic puppies from Rowena. Um, changes to online viewing, uh, which were inevitable because those were the guidelines and that's all that could be done at the time. But what we don't want to see is that being carried forwards into the future um, when uh, um, people should be going and actually seeing their puppy in live, in the environment in which is being reared. And again, pointing out what are probably going to be lifetime consequences for these puppies that were brought up during the pandemic. Lifetime lack of socialization consequences and the fear of things that they won't have met as puppies. Um, and lifetime consequences too with separation related behavior because they're used to having people around all the time. And lastly from Sarah, um, healthcare seeking. Obviously a lot of owners found that very stressful not surprisingly, handing over their sick animal to somebody uh, in a car park to go away and be assessed, and then a brief discussion either over a phone or a car park. Um, and interestingly, that they perceived that as a lower quality of care, whereas I'm sure the veterinary profession uh, would claim that the quality of care was as good as it would have been in normal circumstances. And clearly, that's going to have an influence on long term behavior. So, as I say, a, a really excellent day. Um, I hope that's a, a, an adequate summary um, of what we've talked about. Now, uh, AWF has fixed, fixed terms for chairman. Uh, and uh, sadly, or sadly for me anyway, this is the end of my tour as chair of AWF. Uh, I actually hand over in November. Um, and I have done actually 10 years on the board of AWF. So it's going to leave a big hole in my life. Um, AWF has always been a huge supporter of, of research relevant to practice. And I think one of the things that we've done over this past decade is to shift our, shift our emphasis a little bit away from large animal, which is inevitably a, a smaller proportion of the practice, and practicing vets over to uh, a more general view of what vets do in practice. Since the inception of AWF, we've invested over two million pounds in research, um, which is an amazing amount of money. Much of it coming from the Norman Haywood Fund and focused on large animals, but now much of it coming from uh, normal reserves um, uh, and going into, as you've seen today, the uh, small animal practice as well. One of the things that I've always argued against uh, in welfare situations uh, is how you prioritize where you spend your money. And so uh, the inception of the Delphi project, uh, uh, trying to prioritize where we should spend our money in the future, and also trying to influence other people where they might spend their money in, into those issues where welfare is really the most important thing. So getting away from 
who shouts loudest to actually where is the real need for money to be spent. And of course, the, the student grant schemes are part of that process too, because we're encouraging future generations to go into the sort of research that we want to do. We've also expanded our range of smaller debates uh, and student talks, um, and we've started now talking to the Young Vet Network as well as to, to students. And all of this is intended to keep in the front of, of young vet mind and aspiring vet minds that actually research and welfare uh, and the ethical issues behind welfare are things that they should be thinking about in their day-to-day -day practice. The original trust deed that set up AWF in 1983, uh, of course, is very out of date. And we've spent a lot of effort in the last couple of years uh, working to modernize governance structure and to cement our relationship with BVA, who are, after all, uh, our parents. That will come into practice on the 1st of January next year uh, and give us a, a, a new structure. None of that is going to happen if we haven't got money. And so uh, we have been, again, in the last 18 months or so, working on a fundraising strategy to ensure that we have a, a long-term financial viability for AWF. We've got to keep this going, and we can only do so if we have the funds to do it. There is a bottom line, of course, in that, and that is give us your money. Um, and we do rely on both individual donations and on legacies uh, to, uh, to do our work. So it's important that we look better at that. We've had some fantastic support in my decade from the BVA and from the officers of BVA, two of whom sit as uh, trustees of AWF. Um, and we couldn't have done any of it without, BV without AWF staff supported by BVA staff. We've been lucky throughout my time as, as a trustee to have uh, really fantastic staff supporting us, uh, and they go on doing so. And Erica and Sean, who've run today in the background, you won't have seen, but I can assure you that they've actually done most of the work and they're fantastic. And of course, we couldn't either do it without an outstanding quality of trustees. Um, it's a, a wonderful reflection that when we last advertised for, for trustees, I think we got about 60 applicants. You talk to most charities and, and they have difficulty finding trustees at all. That says something too about AWF and what it achieves. So where are we going forwards? Well, we've now got uh, a, a new strategic plan. We have a three year theme to prioritize research and do debate. That's currently breeding for better welfare, and you'll see some of the reflection of that uh, in, in today's discussion forum. You can already see some of the results. Pandemic puppies are a classic example of that. And the priority, the, the publicity that that's getting has only be good for AWF because it raises our profile. So I hope I leave AWF in a better place. I think I do, but I'm very happy to hand over to Julian, who's going to pick up the reins and be a safe pair of hands. Thank, thank you, Chris. Um, because this is your last discussion forum under your exceptional chairmanship, I can't let you go without saying a heartfelt thank you from us all. We've been truly fortunate to have had you as chair these last five years. And as your term of office comes to an end shortly, you leave an extraordinarily hard and daunting act to follow. Today, as always, has been a beautiful demonstration of how to professionally chair a notable and learned event, even with your bit of Bob Geldof at the very end. However, behind the scenes, AWF has benefited enormously from your extensive charitable experience, whether that be on the legal, the financial, operational matters, uh, to, of course, your colossal knowledge of and drive to improve animal welfare which has rightly been recognized and honored by the Royal College and society at large. Your input has further enhanced the charity and put us in a first rate place from which we will continue to progress. I've just got to say, there's one remarkable attribute to the phenomenon that is Chris Lawrence. 
And that is, he never fails to know someone in the right place. A, a complex neural network or worldwide web of his very own. And I'm going to truly miss the intervention of, I know her, we sit on the same committee. We're going to be sadly missing that. So thank you from us all, the staff, Erica and Sean, as you rightly mentioned, all those within BVA who behind the scenes have supported us so well, the trustees past and present, and importantly, those who've benefited from our charitable aims, whether that be research, education, puppy contract, or debate such as we have seen today. You've made sure that we remain a charity with a critical role to play in the welfare of animals, run by the profession, with welfare experts and for our profession with an equitable and egalitarian approach to improve welfare for all the species we see. So thank you very much, Chris. Julian, thank you very much. That's very kind. So before we go, we hope you had a, a, an inspiring day. We hope you've gained lots of insights and knowledge, but we need your feedback. The feedback link is in the chat box. Please fill that in before you go. Look out for future emails uh, with CPD certificates and links to the videos. You'll be able to watch it all again. The next discussion forum, hopefully, will be in person at One Great George Street in May next year. Look out for the ticket launch by signing up to our monthly updates if you haven't done so already. And as I mentioned, uh, AWF relies on, on donations to fund what we do. If you'd like to play a part in AWF's mission to improve animal welfare for all animals, please head over to the website where you can do exactly, as I said before, give us your money. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, a safe journey home if you're not already home.